just to extend the thanks to everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, I'm Harold Offay, and I've had the pleasure of spending seven weeks here at Wising. Um, just to kind of maybe kind of preface how we're going to kind of deal with the kind of conversation. Um, Zach and I have had some initial conversation. I should just say that I've been wanting to meet, I'm sort of super fanning out here, <laughs> really geekly, but I've been wanting to meet Zach for ages, mm -hmm. and I feel like I've been sort of dancing around his, his presence, <laughs> and um, his, his writing and work is just, I think, really just fantastic, and has been, I think, during this period has helped, and particularly just talking to you more recently, has really helped to kind of crystallise some things that I've been thinking about. So what we're going to do is a sense, a kind of short sharing. I'm going to show some references that maybe kind of position some of the things that I've been thinking about and doing during the residency. Um, and then Zach is going to um, show some references. And uh, we're getting an amazing exclusive from his upcoming work. Um, and then we're just going to kind of extend the conversation and if, by all means kind of sort of join in. Um, so I'll just start by maybe just kind of mapping some of the things that I've been kind of looking at and referencing and thinking about. Um, so the, this first slide, I've got a few kind of short references to kind of show, um, is a kind of an extension of an ongoing project that I've been doing called Covers, which has been looking at um, what I call a kind of very idiosyncratic kind of archiving of um, album covers by... Um, black artists from the 70s and 80s. Um, and that series has mainly been constituted by looking at images of, of, of black women, soul singers, um, people like Grace Jones. Um, um, but I've more recently been really interested in this trope of um, black men in the 80s, assuming this kind of repose, this what I call a lounging kind of position, um, that has these kind of like, Kind of classical echoes. So we've talked about things like Olympia, um, but you might. But so I'm really interested in, in in this within this kind of particular period. This this pose seeming quite that lots of stars adopting this. So you will be familiar with Michael Jackson and and Lionel Richie. Um, and what I've been interested with this with this project is through this strategy of kind of reenacting these positions and these poses. Um, so I've looked at many, so these are some early examples, but I've more recently been very focused on, this is an image uh, of an album cover by um, an American soul singer called Teddy Bendergrass. Um, again, adopting this kind of lo lounging position, but um, I've been particularly kind of drawn to this, the framing and composition of, of this particular pose that he kind of adopts. Um, and these kind of sort of, just very, very formally, the kind of sort of power postures. Also, this notions of how masculinity are kind of represented, I think, through the adoption of this pose. So, anyway, a lot of this is just very formally kind of sort of driven. Um, a sort of interesting biographical detail that I found quite recently was that, um, so this was in 1981, this album cover was shot. And, and a year later, Pendergrass was involved in a really horrific car accident that, that left him paralysed from the neck down. So it's kind of like this, this really thinking about his kind of body. And um, he died in 2010, so he had this kind of long period of, of being paralysed. And actually his whole persona was very, it was a bit like a kind of a Barry White figure, like very sexual, soul, sensual, kind of like masculine um, music. Um, so, very simply, and these are kind of sort of, I see this is just quite, I'm glad you're laughing, that's good. Um, so I've just been really thinking about kind of this idea of a kind of typology, and just assuming the pose in different locations. So this is just around different locations in Wising, um, and really thinking about repeating and reconfiguring the pose, um, and uh, I'll plug um, next Friday, um, I've been invited to um, do a kind of pop-up, pop-up kind of performance workshop at, at Tate Modern as part of their Uniqlo Later Tate season. Um, so I'm going to be inviting people to assume three poses, including this pose, and photographing them. 
And this is linked to the kind of Soul of the Nation show that's on at the moment at Tate Modern. Um, so yeah, I've been really interested in just really thinking about the kind of dynamics of this kind of, this pose through these simple kind of replications of it. Um, and again, I, I've really been interested in the idea of the album cover as a kind of, in terms of, as a functional piece of design that articulates representation, that is about distilling identity, the identity of the music, the identity of the artist, um, uh, and, and thinking about it as a piece of kind of visual communication, particularly within a historic framework. And I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in this period of the kind of 70s and 80s um, as a kind of sort of hyper-representational kind of sort of moment. Um, so one of the other things that I've been doing here is trying to kind of interrogate what I see as some quite crucial terms. Um, and one that I focused on quite particularly is this idea of realness, which um, for me, I mean, it has many kind of sort of references, but one of the things that I've been, that it, that's partly come out of is um, the film Paris is Burning, um, which is this kind of documentary film about the kind of Vogue ball scene in, in New York in the early 90s. Um, and really thinking about this idea of embodying realness and manifestations, particularly within kind of popular culture. Um, and more recently, I focused very particularly on this phenomena of the all-female panel talk show. So I'm just going to show a little clip from um, an example of this. And this example is from a talk show. So you're all probably familiar with, in the UK, there's like this show called Loose Women, where you've got these five women and Cool. So there's, and this is appropriated from a, a quite established American genre, um, and um, so this is an example of this show. This show is called The Real, and for me that's also re really interesting in terms of the framing of it and ideas of authenticity. And this particular panel is constituted by sort of five women, um, uh, all women of colour, um, and on this particular show. They are interviewing Rachel Dolezal, who you may or may not be aware, a few years ago was outed by her family um, because she was living as an African-American woman, although she was by birth Caucasian. Um, and it sparked a lot of debate about this idea of transracialism. But what I'm particularly interested in within this scene, and I've been transcribing this, trans transcribing interaction, is the framing of identity and authenticity through this through this conversation. So I'll just... Uh, there were some people that felt that you never identified yourself as white. So, like, when you went to Howard University, some people felt like they never knew you were white, you were black. And so they felt like maybe the scholarship or when you, the, you know, when you got admitted to Howard, that took an opportunity from a black woman. So that's why a lot of people... It's like, we, you can identify, for sure. you're beautiful, but we're trying to understand <clears throat> why, in some instances, yeah. you never told people that, that you, you were, were white. white. Yeah. I mean, it, are you ashamed of being white? Well, like Dick Gregory says, white isn't a race, it's a state of mind. Okay, Nothing but you know, but no, no, let me tell you something, I'm black. I can't <laughs> be you. I can't reverse myself. Right. I, let me tell you, Rachel, if That's the police exactly stop the me, the police got me. You you could th you could throw that off and show that little like nice fine hair up under, and you might get away. I may not. I may not even make it in the jail. Well, so it's a difference. Okay. It's a big difference. Well, Rachel, mm -hmm. following that, I have a question. Right. What does what does being black mean to you, and why 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 do you want to be black? Well, I think that you know sometimes how we feel is more powerful than how we're born. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, blackness can be defined as philosophical, cultural, okay. biological, you know, yeah, a lot of different things right. for a lot of different people. And I think you do have to kind of like walk the walk if that's how, who you are. Okay. So. Yeah. so you feel that you walk the walk of a black woman? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So, uh, go ahead, get your line. No, I just want to say, could you expand on that? Well, I mean, I think, you know, walking the walk in terms of philosophical and cultural, like what I was talking about as far as the broader definition, the pan-African definition of um, blackness, I think um, you're talking about 
then changing it to um, a black woman. Is there a singular experience? Is uh, there one absolutely. experience? Absolutely. Um, there are opportunities that I might not get that you can have only because of the color of my skin, not because I'm a smart, beautiful, amazing mother, wife, and entrepreneur. I you know? Um, e even as successful as I am now, there are lots of doors that I can't walk into that you can definitely walk into. So I just really want to know, like, have you, ex have you ever experienced anything like that? The police mark black on my traffic tickets. Wait, they what? They what? Um, so, I've been sort of really interested in this exchange and really how the, the discourse is kind of framed, one, through this very kind of subjective position of the women, with these women of colour that kind of confronting Rachel, and then Rachel really kind of sort of trying to kind of find a way of kind of explaining her own sense of subjectivity but very much using this kind of academic language. Um, so she's kind of contesting notions of blackness and white and, and race. Um, and so, so, yeah, one of the things I'm really interested in is, is in how this discourse is then filtered through the media in this particular kind of format um, for debate and, and, and discussion and in it as a kind of structure for looking at notions of authenticity. Um, actually, one of the things... I'm just going to go to the end because I, I like this end slide. Um, uh, so the whole show is framed around this notion of, of kind of realness and authenticity and, um, uh, and, and being true to oneself and um, this, this notion of really trying to interrogate kind of truth, which is really, I find, sort of problematic, but again, distilled within this particular situation is quite complex. So one of the things I've been trying to do is trying to break it down a little bit by transcribing it and really thinking about it as a text which, which maybe could be re-performed or somehow interrogating the kind of the nuances and references and use of, use of language that is contained within that particular scene. Um, and like I said, beyond that, um, this is my last slide, just really thinking about the notions of kind of realness and authenticity and how they're kind of diffused through... Um, the media and kind of popular culture. So, um, one of the, a very simple exercise, again, I'm really into kind of these like sort of typologies, is just kind of collecting these albums that, uh, that reference this notion of the real thing. Um, and this, again, is a kind of really popular kind of trope reference within, um, within a lot of these kind of uh, black artists. Um, yeah, so I'm going to stop there because I could go on because we're going to go on to Zach's going to go on to show us some stuff and then we can. Okay, so I'm going to pull your stuff up. <clears throat> this will probably just. Okay. I'll just let this play and then I'll speak.
Hi everyone, I'm Zach. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I'd really like to thank Harold for inviting me because I've also been looking forward to talking to him, catching him at some point. So now it's finally happening, which is amazing. So um, I've been doing work for the last 10 years around uh, kind of questions of science and technology. Um, more specifically, I'm really interested in surveillance, securitization um, from kind of looking at it from queer politics or feminist politics, things like that. So um, this video that I just showed you is for a project that I'm currently researching. And what you just watched is a video that actually plays in the Frankfurt airport before you're going through security. It's actually the Terminal B in Frankfurt airport, which is actually where you would go if you're flying back to the United Kingdom uh, from Germany. So um, this video is installed um, in about a dozen, uh, kind of maybe 15 monitors all throughout the security area. So you're basically watching this video on repeat as you're about to go through right, this exact uh, process. And importantly, um, you know, I, I have encountered this multiple times um, traveling through Frankfurt, so I finally decided to do, so, do a project around this because I can't seem to escape it. And um, one thing that really struck me as I was, um, the last time I was going through the security area is that the security area began to feel like a kind of multimedia installation. Like I started to think of it as a Namjoon Pike uh, piece gone terribly wrong. And um, one of the most striking things is that this video is actually playing above all of the body scanners um, that are stationed throughout the security area. So. Um, these body scanners, right, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, they're the 3D body scanners that you step inside, right, you plant your feet um, where the yellow footprints are, and you hold your arms up. Um, and those body scanners are called ProVision 2. I'm really interested in thinking about this idea of ProVision 2 actually as some kind of philosophical concept that can actually go much further beyond than just like what the company has chosen to name this machine. You know, what is ProVision, um, you know, in this kind of time of high security? And the fact is that this video is sitting above this body scanner. It means that the video is literally subtitled with the phrase ProVision 2. So, of course, I mean, the video, you know, it's, um, it's not so obtuse, right? We have a white German couple um, that are going through security and the way that security is attempted to be normalized here is through right, the genre of romantic comedy. So the way that I like to think about this is that right, as um, the man and woman are going through security um, and as their bodies are being touched right, by security agents, they kind of more intensively look at each other as if by looking at each other, um, they're able to somehow transform the administrative touch of a security agent into some kind of like sexual or sensual caress. So um, it's interesting to think of kind of like how these spaces work, um, that basically this video kind of implies that, um, you know, if you're white, if you're heterosexual, then going through this is kind of going, is going to be a breeze. But um, one of the other things, because I just kind of want to go through this stuff quickly and then we can kind of hash it out later if we want. Um, one of the things that really strikes me about that kind of uh, configuration of the video with the body scanner is that in the United States, um, since they've been installed, and in a, a very large amount of transgender people have been getting detained at airports in the United States under uh, what is called pre-terrorist suspicion. And this is because the way that those body scanners work is they use radio waves that basically bounce off the body. So what they're doing is they're, they're assessing the surface of the body. So when someone who is assumed to be a man or a woman enters that body scanner and the radio waves bounce off their body, if the assumed surface doesn't match, this is actually enough now to flag someone for pre-terrorist suspicions because if the, it's basically if the topological surface is off, then there could be a bomb, there could be a weapon, something could be concealed, something isn't right. So it's... um. It's kind of incredible to think that that video is literally playing on top of these body scanners um, that are actually causing um, so many problems for transgender people to actually travel now. Um, it, I mean, this could be happening in other countries, but I know this specifically about the United States. So again, this idea of like, what is, what is vision here? You know, what is provision? Like, how is the body somehow made visible right in this moment, uh, technologically for the purposes of security? Okay. Next project, 
um, is um, a project that uh, I've been doing research on biometrics for a number a number of years, and this is kind of the newest uh, bit that I'm I'm working on. And for those of you that aren't familiar with biometrics, these are digital technologies like facial recognition, um, hand um, like hand fingerprint scans, um, iris scans, basically digital technologies that again read the surface of your body. This is the kind of um, similarity between the body scanner and biometrics. They digitally quantify the surface of your body and they're somehow able to arrive at some kind of scientifically objective core truth about who you are as a unique individual in the world. So I moved to the United Kingdom in the summer of 2015 to start a teaching post at Goldsmiths and I was living in New York City at the time and um, so I had to apply for a work visa. And uh, the United Kingdom at this point had actually just changed its visa scheme to, a, to what is now called uh, biometric residence permits. These are the, this is the official title now of UK work visas, biometric residence permits. So part of the process of getting a work visa <coughs> involves going to what's called um, biometric enrollment in your home country before you enter the United Kingdom. So um, during the visa process, I was, this is, this is um, part of an email that home, home office here had emailed me. And as you can see, um, right, it says, um, this is the address that I must go to on this date in New York uh, to give my biometrics. But I became very obsessed with the uh, last sentence in this, this top bit where they say, right, this is either to submit documentation and or to enable us to collect your biometrics unless you are bio-exempt. Now, this is um, what an old art mentor of mine would call administrative poetry. Um, what is bio-exempt, right? What an incredible, rich philosophical term. You know, when I see that, I can just see 10 philosophical volumes on bio-exemption kind of like lining the bookshelf. Um, but right, it's not defined. And again, just kind of like provision, I'm very interested with my practice in taking kind of bureaucratic or commercial terms and kind of thinking them beyond like how they're kind of maybe uh, used within a specific context. So just like provision, you know, what is bio-exempt here? Now, um, you can actually get a whole dossier on biometrics that Home Office wrote in 2016. It's about 80 pages. And when you go through it, they kind of oscillate between two phrases, bio-exempt and exempt from control. And um, it means something very kind of boring and specific to them. There are certain types of people that do not have to give their biometrics to the state in order to move across borders. And these are things like diplomats, um, children of a certain age, um, people that have any kind of kind of bodily mutilation, such as, right, if you have no fingerprints. But I think um, bio-exemption is something, again, that we could kind of think a lot further. You know, like, what is bio-exempt here? And, Partially, you know, I ultimately think this term is like profoundly cynical and kind of evil um, in the sense that if bio here really means, right, the surfaces of bodies, right, that's what's being analyzed here, right, the surface of your body. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but the surfaces of bodies are literally what contain us as human beings. So who is actually able to be exempt, you know, from that kind of understanding of bio? So there's something about bio-exempt, I think, that ultimately is an impossibility. But still, it's interesting to think about this as a term that kind of is an operation that affects certain types of people. So to connect this to um, questions around race, um, a lot of biometric technologies, when they first come out, have actually had an incredibly difficult time even detecting, let alone analyzing, black skin. And again, this, is caused, um, this can cause potential problems when moving through these um, kind of very bureaucratic legal spaces when the technologies actually are calibrated for very particular types of people and skin. Okay, so provision, bio-exempt. Um, now, what do, you, what do you think? Should I do the film or do you think I should just show this little palantir thing? Should we go into the film? Okay, sure. I'll just show a little. Like, Do you want to show the pawns here? No, I can show. I'll show. No, no, I'll show the film. <laughs> okay, I'm just I'm jumping quickly, but um, no, no, no. we can kind of connect the threads. Yeah. Um, okay, so 
I'm working on a film right now. That's the third uh, project, but it's in a, um, a more, well, it's not so finalized, as you'll see. Um, this is the film that I'm making <clears throat> for Gasworks, which, which is a show I have opening um, at the end of September. This um, film is a reimagining of bits of Derek Jarman's film, Jubilee. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. It takes place in 2033 in California. Um, I think it's, I, I can't give too much exhibition, but what I'll say is, instead of beginning with Queen Elizabeth, it begins with the, a novelist and philosopher, Ayn Rand, um, in 1955 in New York City. She is gathered with members of her collective, which were a group of followers she had, uh, including Alan Greenspan. They take LSD. They're visited by an artificial intelligence from Japan who takes them to see um, a fall in Silicon Valley in 2033. So the scene that I'm going to show you um, is in the Palantir Technologies building. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this company. Um, it's, a data, it's a data analytics company um, founded by Peter Thiel, a known Donald Trump supporter, all around terrible human being. And Peter Thiel has been executed in the film. And this queer militant AI prophet is, has um, taken over his desk. Well, there's a whole bunch of queer militants. And um, this scene is a reimagining, for those of you that are familiar with Jubilee, um, with the scene with amyl nitrate at the beginning, amyl nitrate's um, history lesson, and her dance. Maybe we'll, we'll get through the lecture and see how you're feeling. It's about three minutes long, but it, it begins with an introduction by, um, um, by, by someone. It's in Spanish. It's, it's quite short, though. I mean, basically what she's saying is, um, yeah, she's just introducing the character whose name is Nootropics, just so you know, which is a play off of um, the fact that LSD in Silicon Valley now has become a nootropics, which means smart drug. So now people in Silicon Valley microdose on LSD daily to actually increase work capacity um, and kind of brain capacity. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, hopefully it'll work. So, I mean, you're very much in the kind of midst of the, the kind of the, the editing film and there's a mm -hmm. lot to kind of sort of go back into it. Um, maybe it would help if you talked a bit about, because we didn't see the, the clip of the, the company name. Mm. Um, and the whole mythology around that, and these notions of kind of mythology that I think have been yeah, around the idea. described into kind of corporate culture. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, well, one thing I'm really fascinated by with Peter Thiel's data analytics company is the fact that it's named Palantir. Um, and uh, Palantir actually comes from Lord of the Rings. The Palantir is the crystal ball, kind of this um, the all-seeing stone in Lord of the Rings. So what's, so I kind of, um, the way that I've, I've been thinking about this is that um, Peter Thiel's company kind of represents some kind of like a data mysticism or some kind of like new surveillance mysticism. The way that um, the crystal ball uh, gets appropriated as this kind of device that can just magically see into the future, kind of give all access, and also very importantly, it can look back to the past. Um, and that this company, right, kind of gets um, kind of conceptualized as uh, today's uh, Palantir. And there are kind of two branches or two kind of main projects that kind of get broken out into what Palantir do. One is called Palantir uh, Gotham, which is their counterterrorism project. So they work uh, ex uh, very specifically with the U.S. Department of Defense, with the um, National Security Agency, the CIA, et cetera, to do uh, various counterterrorism operations. And the other is called um, Palantir Metropolis, which is specifically um, working with various banks, financial companies, and hedge funds. So kind of pursuing um, finance and counterterrorism. But right, it's, I think it's more just, I'm I, like deeply fascinated by this kind of conceptualization. And for me, the way that that kind of threads back to Jubilee in a really interesting way is that in the original uh, Jubilee by Jarman, it begins with Elizabeth and John Dee, and John Dee was Elizabeth's um, spiritual advisor and mathematician, and one of the things he has right is a crystal ball. So it's just, it's just really interesting to think about 
yeah, the kind of like, myth, I guess like you were saying, mythologizing of these companies as um, a way, um, how they've kind of developed a way to see into the future. No one actually knows uh, necessarily, you know, how that's kind of specifically working, where the data streams and partnerships are. But right, this is kind of in the service of not just um, seeing the future, but also preempting it, mm -hmm. right? The whole point is we see the future so we can stop certain things from happening. Is, um, is this a good point to segue into opacity? In yes, song? let's and, do that. Um, um, I mean, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about, because I think you've been you're writing really interestingly around sure. that in relation to ideas of transparency. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, yeah, I'm writing it, well, I've been writing it for years. Hopefully it'll be finished one of these days. Um, a book <laughs> called <laughs> Informatic Opacity, and I'm very interested in um, the Caribbean uh, philosopher and poet Edward Glissant and his writings on opacity, and he has um, you know, some really beautiful expressions where he says, we must uh, clamor for the right to opacity for everyone. He has a um, very kind of like um, interesting critique of transparency. I think a, a simple way to, to kind of parse, it's a very complicated concept, obviously, but maybe a, a, a easy starting point is that you know, opacity is some kind of alterity that exists within yourself. Uh, within your relationships to other people that can't be, um, it can't be identified, it can't be classified, it can't be broken down. Or maybe the point is, is that it can, and of course people throughout history try to do exactly that. But for Glissant, that's kind of an imperialist gesture. It's kind of ethical violation that you know, he suggests we should work against. Um, and I guess the way that I kind of see that with um, technologies like the body scanner and biometrics is that the kind of common rhetoric around that is surveillance and privacy. That's always the kind of like, you know, it's kind of, that's how the um, antagonism is always set up. And I just, um, that falls a little flat for me. Like I think, um, for me, I'm more interested in thinking about those things as kind of a, a drama of capture and opacity. You know, and capture is a technical term. It's kind of what the body scanner is doing. It's what the biometrics are doing. They're, they're capturing um, certain information of you kind of processing that. And, um, and then of course, you know, as I was trying to kind of illustrate with my examples with the airport, um, when, you know, when your body is basically abstracted by technologies, you know, sometimes that works for certain people because the technologies are kind of calibrated for those bodies and other times it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's, I find it very productive, especially if you're interested in thinking about these contemporary issues from any kind of minoritarian political framework to actually kind of maybe think more about opacity because that's exactly what those technologies are designed to annihilate. They're, they're designed to annihilate the opacity of, of the other. And I think what's really profound about that is that it's at the scale at which they're operating, you know, which of course is the global scale, and that um, countries, governments, private security companies, militaries, paramilitaries, right, are kind of like implementing these as kind of standard go-to technologies which um, I think maybe another thing that's interesting for you is like what that's doing to identity. You know, like these technologies put forth a very particular definition of identity. It's something that is disembodied. It's something that can be 100% quantifiable by a digital machine. And then like, you know, companies and governments are importing that definition of um, identity and basically kind of putting that on, you know, whole populations as a kind of sorting and control mechanism. Because it, for me, there's this interesting thing between like uh, the notion of uh, opacity in terms of a kind of resistance mm -hmm. to a kind of controlling gaze or the idea of kind of a commodification that comes mm -hmm. with empiricism. So the idea of kind of, you know, collecting data, um, processing that in the way that you were kind of sort of talking about yeah. and then that being turned yeah. into product. And this mm -hmm. idea of a kind of resistance, mm -hmm. maybe claiming a space for uncertainty. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, the opaque. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a fun way to actually connect to the real. I wrote yeah. so much down while you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, I think, I mean, that's one way I would actually respond to that. Like, I think opacity is the real, you know, and I think, and, and to me, what's interesting about that is, you know, Glissant makes these kind of like powerful ontological claims. So I think that's really important because it's not that, you know, we're trying to kind of become opaque or something like that. It's like, no, actually, that is existence. Mm -hmm. You know, that is how we are in the world. Mm -hmm. And then things come and violate that, and that causes political problems. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's kind of like we've always already been opaque. Mm -hmm. 
And then there are right there are ways of trying to resist, or that's where the kind of tactical and resistant I think comes in. You, but you, sorry, I'm just no, but I just yeah. remember that you were making this leap to kind of sort of um, 80s feminist discourse that was group, rooted in materialism or materiality. Mm, Have mm. I got that right? Was, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just because I, I remember oh, yeah. you know, in our previous conversation that you were talking about these these. Um, oh right, know, the science. Yeah, yeah, yeah of using science as a kind of. Yeah, well, I love the um, like the, the like the the feminist Marxist science and technology studies stuff from the seventies and eighties, and I think what I like about that is that they they really say fuck you to a lot of postmodernism and poststructuralist thought because you know their argument is that not everything can just get whittled away to language and discourse that like there it like there, <laughs> there's materiality in the world right and it it can't just be reduced to language, and I think they give like a really kind of robust way to think about you know, the resistance of materiality itself as a kind of object, like, as a kind of objectivity. Um, and that's where I see that, you know, because if you think about, if you just take the example of when you're standing inside the body scanner, right, like, what is the body? Like, what is the body in that moment? Is it the way that it's visualized on the machine, which is actually incredible, they look like chalk figures of dead bodies. Mm -hmm. it's a, and the companies call them very specifically generic mannequins. Right, generic mannequins that somehow kind of accommodate anybody, but of course they don't. Mm -hmm. um, right, that's a kind of mediated representation, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it like, you know, right, the kind of like material embodied thing inside that mm -hmm. thing that you basically talk about looks diagrams, like a cage? Don't you? I think I remember yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one way to kind of think about it. It's like the security produces certain kind of diagrams of body that pe bodies that people think are naturalized, normalized, objective, but of course. Right, a line, you know, there's kind of a leap, right? People develop technologies, they write algorithms, they have human bias, but then somehow lead to these representations that people think are true. But right, I guess the point is like, it's always important to kind of draw the line between the representation and the embodied mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, okay, I had a quite well, I mean, one, <laughs> one thing I wrote down was, and I, I mean, I know you won't have the answer to this, but I thought it was a fun question, is how, how to lounge or how does one lounge um, like in security or in an airport? You know, I thought, I thought that was kind of an interesting moment to think about your interest in lounging and poses. Yeah. Because of course that airport video is like, it's such a kind of like performance of kind yeah. of poses and kind of, you know, like, I mean, it's really kind of, you're marshaled in that way through yeah. an airport. Yeah. So I was like, wow, what is the lounge? What is the lounging pose? <laughs> well, it's interesting because we, I mean, it's one of the things we had like a kind of crit um, Wednesday or Thursday? I can't remember whenever it was. But um, I think for me, that's also one of the things that's kind of lacking from the, these initial images. And we talked about the, the idea of context and that mm -hmm. reframing that pose within particular contexts yeah. where it might have a different agency. Yeah. Yeah. And thinking about spaces where, you know, being in that pose might challenge or test or antagonize or disrupt. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting you mentioned the idea of doing, adopting that pose within the airport, which yeah. is this really kind of policed yeah. kind of like space yeah. where even the architecture and the, I always think about that thing about the airport seats, like you, you can't yeah, actually, because yeah. I've got the... Unless you're in the lounge. Unless you're in the, yeah, unless you're <laughs> in the kind of VIP lounge, which I've never had the <laughs> pleasure of entering. But, but yeah, you're right, I mean, I think that, potentially thinking about that within that yeah. space. I mean, I, I mean, I've been thinking of it a bit more conventionally through just that idea of what is it about this moment in the 80s where these yeah. guys were adopting that pose in relation mm -hmm. to their identity and marketing, yeah. you know. And yeah, do you want to say something? Is there something about opacity in that for you that you're kind of exploring? Or even if we went to the Rachel Dolezal material, <laughs> I'm curious to hear. <laughs> Well, I know. You don't have to, you don't want to. No, no, I just, I don't know. I mean, I'm still working through a lot of that, really, in yeah. terms of, I mean, I, I, th I think, um, like I said, with the, with the opacity stuff, I'm just more interested in that as a kind of, um, as, uh, as a kind of philosophical framework that allows mm -hmm. one to think about um, strategies of resistance in, in relation to these, you know, dominant structures that seem to be about collecting data and managing and processing and fixing mm -hmm. um, and thinking about, uh, in a way, allowing for this idea of kind of these, these ruptures and notions of uncertainty and, and, and doubt and 
kind of claiming that space. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I'm coming from mm -hmm. in relation to an interest, kind of in that. And also, I mean, I've been really interested in, I so I'm jumping around here, but that's okay. I said, then what you're saying about um, an idea of really thinking about material, materiality and reclaiming materiality yeah. as a challenge to postmodernism. Yeah. Because now, you know, there's all this discussion about postmodernism being yeah, adopted actually, by the alt right yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, the whole deconstruction project and the, this idea that there is no reality and it's all fake. Yeah, and it's all, yeah, exactly. And go into those inevitable. I mean, maybe do, I, do you, I feel like we could say something about queerness there as well. Mm. If you. If what you feel so inclined? Well, um, what, where I just were just in terms of you know if you have any thoughts then on queerness you know that kind of moves away from postmodern poststructuralism you know which it's certainly indebted to or at least queer theory and it's. Uh, I mean, I guess um, I don't know. I mean, I've been I guess maybe thinking things back through these notions of going back to the kind of body and, and um, these ideas of experiences of authenticity and realness yeah, and how, yeah. how are those kind of constituted within this territory of queerness, mm -hmm. which is also I find really problematic in terms of kind of navigating where that is now yeah. as, as a space that's been defined but contested yeah, and exactly. claimed it's by like various, and being occupied and... Mm -hmm increasingly commodified and um, and, and fractured. Yeah. Um, what, how is that constituted for people? So for me, it's partly about kind of mapping that and, mm -hmm. you know, there's an idea of this kind of, it being centered within a subjective experience, but yeah. is that, does that become overly essentialized mm -hmm. and, and bracketed? Yeah. Is, is that, yeah. you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the way I would respond to that mm. is, I mean, I think I'm just a very materialist thinker. Mm. And um, I th like I was telling you before, I think, you know, I kind of gravitated toward opacity because I thought it could do a certain kind of material work that I felt like I was hitting a wall with queerness. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, the th I guess the challenges that I see with queerness as something um, to try and, like, kind of keep in operation is, like, you know, it, it always kind of gets subtended as, you know, part of LGBT politics. Like, you know, how do you kind of break it away from the kind of, I, you know, as an identity, right? And I mean, I think that the interest in opacity, like we've talked about, is also about certain refusals to engage with, with you know, particular regimes of visibility or recognition or representation. And I mean, the other thing for me, because I have a strong interest in science and technology, is that you know, I feel like queerness's conception of power is very human-centric, mm. and that so much of how power is wielded today is deeply embedded in techniques. Yeah. Mm. And you know, if we actually take that very seriously, you know, I feel like you would have a very different kind of queerness in operation mm. today. Mm. And of course, like people are doing this. You know, it is kind of like it's a thing that's happening. But mm. um, it seems to me that's a challenge with that term. You know, if we want to try and kind of move it forward maybe. It's more, maybe more about structural change. I mean, just aware that we should maybe... Oh, yeah. Because we... Time... Yeah, so in, in a minute, we, we should yes. move up to okay. uh, Yes. But uh, if there are any questions... I haven't left any time for this, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry but if there are any... Did you find... It's completely fascinating. Did you find an equal number of male LP covers with white singers also lounging? I mean, I'm just interested how much it is to do with male, which you did talk about, mm -hmm. so it's way back into yeah, conversation, yeah. and how much it was specifically uh, mm -hmm. because they were black artists. And then I was obviously, like, I'm sure I was thinking of Manet and Deja, like, you know, yeah, yeah. obviously. Yes, yeah, yeah. Whether or not that's a sort of subconscious... Um, yeah, did, probably. Did you, find, did you find yourself finding it was very specific to um, black male? Yes. Yeah, particularly in this period of the 80s. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a few kind of, like, you know white guys, kind of, you know, but, and, it, and it's also very specific to this genre of soul, of course, yeah. Yeah, um, so you know, that's, you know. Yeah, okay, no, thanks. Oh, I'm really interested in the poses that you chose to take, but actually, when there's three images, you flip them, so right to them. Yeah. I just wonder if you have anything to say about why, why did you choose to flip them? 
to flip the pose? Um, uh, I mean, I mean very in, there wasn't a very particularly um, intellectual answer to that. It just formally, really, I was quite interested in just positioning, repositioning the pose in relation to the scene. Um, so there were bits of architecture and bits of landscape that I, I was trying it on kind of both sides. Um, so it's kind of sort of, it's like it's very super unresolved, but I was just really interested in how in relation to the architecture and the image, and the, so there's scenes of seeing the landscape or seeing it into another space through what's happening in the foreground. It worked by, by kind of sort of flipping it, as opposed to being slavish to the kind of like original. I'm always interested in the kind of gap that happens with the copy. So for me, it's never about this perfect kind of sort of um, parody or copy of the original. I'm really interested in, in the gap and the mistakes and the failure to, to completely embody the original. Um, are there any more questions? There'll be a chance to um, yeah. talk to Zach and Harold. I think at the end we have some more drinks. Yeah. Yeah, please do. And I encourage you to, no, I'm giving you work, but Zach, but Zach is, yeah, I'm, yeah, talk to him. <laughs> He's here. I'm so excited. Thanks, Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.